This morning, one of the worst kept secrets in Texas politics. State Senator Roland Gutierrez considering a run against Ted Cruz next year. We'll talk about what that race might look like. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick sending a message to House Republicans and their plan to lower property taxes. Hell will freeze over before I do that. Why would we walk away from that? It's, it's ridiculous. Plus, if conservative priorities do not pass, Patrick says he might even force a special legislative session this summer. And early voting begins tomorrow in Texas. Garland ISD in Dallas County asking voters to pass its biggest bond ever, more than a billion dollars. The superintendent, Dr. Ricardo Lopez, making his case to voters. Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Good Sunday morning to you. Before we get to the questions, let's start with the top political headlines across our state. If you skip voting in at least two national elections, Texas Republicans want to suspend your voter registration card. This passed the Senate the other day. Republicans say it would clean up the voter lists. Democrats, though, ask why penalize less active voters? Ohio passed a similar bill and the U.S. Supreme Court upheld that one. Houston is trying to win the Republican National Convention in five years, and it wants the state legislature to help. The city wants to use the hotel occupancy taxes to improve and expand the George R. Brown Convention Center downtown. Houston hopes to land the RNC in 2028, but so do Nashville and Miami. You know, it's been more than 30 years since Republicans were in Houston. And keep an eye on what happens with school choice or education savings accounts as we close in on the end of the legislature. Suburban and rural Republicans in the House killed the idea, but Governor Greg Abbott remains on the road promoting it across the state. And Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick told me this issue is not dead this session, suggesting something might be in the works. Now, let's begin with the Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. He has passed the 30 priorities he laid out this session, most of it red meat, like banning children from drag shows and outlawing critical race theory in state universities, but also broader bills like teacher pay raises and scholarships to hire more nurses in this state. One bill he says will not pass, the House plan to lower property taxes. The Lieutenant Governor taking a tougher tone in this interview with us. Governor, welcome back to the program. The, the clock is ticking right now, a little more than a month left in the session. Uh, the Senate has passed most all of your priorities. Just a couple remain, I believe, right now. The House has not passed that many bills when compared to sessions past. What do you think is not going to get done when the gavel falls at the end of this legislature? Well, for the numbers, just to back up what you're saying, uh, as of last week, they'd only passed 85 bills. Uh, we've passed 316. We're right on pace. Uh, we've also passed out 28 of our 30 priorities. They've passed out few of their priorities or the governor's priorities, the people's priorities. Uh, and so I don't know what will happen, but I know this, Jason, is that the bills that they have to debate are very important and they're going to take a lot of time. And you, know, you can't be on the floor and in committee at the same time. So they're gonna be in committees a long time because we have been on these bills and they're gonna be on the floor a long time. So I hope they can pass all the priorities, but I'm not sure if they can. And part of this reason, Jason, we've been working you know, without stop pretty much. You know, We've been on the floor Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, or, or three days a week, four days a week. They've been on the floor many of these weeks, two days, passing nothing but resolutions. So they're way behind. And uh, that's unfortunate because the people expect us to get our business done. And the senators, I give them all the credit, they're just working you know, their tails off to uh, get the legislation passed as they should. Let's talk about one of those priorities is property yes. taxes. The, the Senate wants to raise the homestead exemption to $70,000. Yes. The House has a different plan, wanting to limit how much school districts can charge, wants to cap the appraisals. Yes. What is a likely compromise, Governor? Well, I can't compromise on bad math. They just have bad math. Now, both of us have compression. Compression is a way to help reduce property taxes with schools. So we both agree on that. We just have to work that out, the exact dollars and how we do it. But the difference is they want appraisal caps uh, at 5%, uh, and we want a homestead exemption increased. Uh, when I became lieutenant governor, the homestead exemption was 15,000. I've been there for decades. I made it 25,000 and 15, 40,000 and 19. And this year for seniors, 100 thousand dollar exemption that means if you live in a three hundred thousand dollar home and you're a senior you're only going to pay tax on a two hundred thousand dollar home that's a savings of about a thousand sixty dollars which i have in my hand here 
for the rest of their life while they live in their home. And if you're under 65, we're taking the homestead exemption from 40 to 70,000. You get $800 a year for as long as you homestead your home, 25, 30 year mortgage. That's $25,000. It's not in the house bill. And the seniors, 15,000, because they're going to live in their homes a shorter period of time than someone in their 30s or 40s. So this is over $100 billion in tax savings over 15 to 20 years. Is, is school choice dead this session? Oh, no, I don't think so. I, I think that for the first time, we're actually, we've broken ground. I, th I think in the House, if you actually analyze the vote uh, the way that we do, the vote was closer than it looked on not putting money in the budget for that. And uh, I'm optimistic we can pass a school choice bill. Now, I don't know what it will look like. Ours is the bill that we pass is the best one in the country. Everybody knows it's the best one in the country. It'll be the largest in the country. Uh, every family would get $8,000 to the school where they would send their child. And here's the, here's the thing with the rural Republicans who vote against it all the time. We're going to pay the schools for five years, Jason. Right. So if the child leaves and opts for a, 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 a education voucher uh, savings account, we're going to give that school the money for that student for five years. So yep. I would say that's way too much. Governor, let's talk about school security for a moment. Sure. We're approaching one year since the mass yes. murder in Uvalde yes. at Robb Elementary. Uh, obviously, another push underway to give districts more money to, to harden schools. Yeah. Senator Brandon Creighton uh, was quoted the other day saying, when the plane has landed at the end of this session, it's going to be a model for this nation. Do you expect yes. the Senate plan that passed is really going to stop school shootings, though? Look, you can never stop evil, Jason. I'm sorry to say. We can pass all the laws. Uh, on everything from murder to rape to you know, carjack. We can pass all the laws. Uh, we can try to protect every citizen. Uh, our police, men and women, do the best they can every day. But there's evil out in the world. Uh, and look at Uvalde. What happened? You know, there was a door. You know, it wasn't even the main door that someone was able to get in. So, for example, we can put hundreds of millions into secure doors, but if they're left open and unlocked. Um, so uh, so, so what's, the answer? what's the answer then? Because the, 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 the answer is, so we're going to put more money over a billion dollars. I think it's about a billion and a half dollars, 1.5 billion into school security um, to find the best ways to secure our school. Uh, we need more uh, officers on duty. We passed a bill just yesterday for retired police officers to come back in, maybe to take a job as security officer uh, in those schools. Um, and so we just have to have everything we can, Jason, to protect those kids. But we can have the greatest security package, um, and if and if doors are left open, um, then security breaks down. So it's a team effort, and we're all in for this. Final question here: Do you expect the governor to call any uh, special legislative sessions this summer? How, how likely is that? Well, I, I I never make plans for the summer when we're in, in session that year because you never know. We had a special session in seventeen. Right now, the pace that the house is moving. Um, there's some big issues that may not come up for a hearing and that will be up to the governor or myself in some cases. I can't call a special session. I can only create a special session as I did in 17 by holding back an important bill. If I think that the people are not getting their priorities heard, if they're not getting the tax relief that they deserve immediately, uh, because our bill takes place this year, theirs is even two years, even though it doesn't do anything on appraisal, it's even two years down the road. If, if I don't think the people are being in the surplus and not being spent wisely, then I can just hold back a bill and, then we have to have a special session. I prefer not to do that, but we'll have that option as I did in 17. Governor, thank you for the time. We appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. The Lieutenant Governor took a lot more questions from us on issues like that Governor pardon of convicted murderer Daniel Perry, the proposed one at least, and why the Lieutenant Governor opposed lowering the state sales tax. Our entire uncut interview on a special episode of Yolitics available to download right now. All right, state lawmakers are revoking even more local control from cities and counties across Texas. The Texas House recently passed bills to limit cities' abilities to issue labor protections and even water restrictions. The question many are asking now, how does this actually affect Texans? I am Mitra is a senior managing editor of the Texas Tribune. He is in Austin, as always. I am good to see you. If these get to the governor's desk for his signature, what will this mean to you and me? Well, for 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 you and it, for you and me and other Texas citizens, it's really going to be kind of like who is kind of setting the, you know, the kind of like the regulations when it comes to labor or things like that. You know, I think uh, one of the you know um, among local uh, officials and critics of this legislation, they feel like it's taking away their ability to respond to their communities. 
I mean, the, the answer to that from um, from business groups and other supporters is that there too, there's too much of a patchwork of local ordinances. So, you know, depending on the type of regulation, whether it's a labor or water restrictions during a drought, drought, you know, it may be affecting the timing of how those things kind of come to pass for, for you and me. And let's talk about, uh, obviously, Texas leads the country in renewable energy, but the legislature has quite a few bills targeting renewable energy this session as opposed to previous sessions. Are any of these really going to uh, pass and make it to the governor's desk? Well, there's a good chance they've gotten good here, like, you know, good length hearings here. And there's been some concerns raised by, you know, rural Texans in particular, but others. And I think a lot of the concern has been just kind of like the uh, the speculation about kind of how, you know, the, the impacts of some of these, whether they're big solar facilities or wind turbines, just kind of their impacts on the environment around them. I think there's a real push here uh, for just kind of getting a better idea of the of the research that's going behind uh, the building of these plants mm -hmm. and, the, and, and broader, you know, ironically, the broader, broader environmental effects, too. So I think those are the things that may get a little bit more uh, scrutiny. We will watch and see what happens. I am back to you in a moment. Thank you. Coming up, State Senator Roland Gutierrez considering a run against U.S. Senator Ted Cruz next year. What might that race look like? And what does Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick's tough talk say about the balance of power in Austin right now? Inside Texas Politics, back in just a moment. Early voting in Texas begins tomorrow for the upcoming local elections. Tuesday is the last day to apply for a mail-in ballot, and Election Day is May 6th. Remember, these are the elected offices, not partisan ones, but most likely to affect your daily life. Voters in Garland will see a big bond proposal on that May 6th ballot. Garland ISD is asking voters to approve $1.3 billion dollars. Garland Superintendent Dr. Ricardo Lopez makes the case on why it is needed, including one big element that every district in the state should be taking a closer look at. Dr. Lopez, good to see you. Thanks for uh, being here today. Uh, Garland ISD ha has a number of things, but broadly speaking, let's break some of these down. The, the district wants to respond to school shootings and spend part of this bond money on improving campus security. What exactly are the changes that you hope to make? Well, first of all, thank you for being on the show. I'm, I'm extremely excited about being here. Um, when we talk about safety and security, that's always been paramount. On this bond program, we're looking at spending $91 million on safety and security. What parents are excited about is we're going to be removing portables from elementary schools and actually building classroom wings. Um, we have 47 elementary schools, and those that have portables with students are now going to have wings, which provides a nice, safe, and secure environment for our kids. We're also looking at ballistic glass, um, our film. Um, we saw in Tennessee how an intruder got in by, by um, shooting through the glass and what we want to do is buy time, keep our kids safe and put a film on there that makes that um, glass not shatter as easily. It gets responders there with enough time to be able to mitigate any threat that we have. So um, we're going to do perimeter fencing. Um, our schools are built where our playgrounds are exposed, so a lot of perimeter fencing to make sure our kids are safe is going to be part of it, um, along with some other factors dealing with uh, safety and security and lighting, cameras, and everything else. Another part of the bond uh, really modernizes campuses, and some are, are, are pretty old. I went to middle school in a building that was built in 1898. Explain wow. how these older campuses impact learning. Yeah, we have our, our school district's over 100 years old, and so some of our campuses were built before World War, World War II. And so um, we have kids in that learning environment, and while we have updated them, I mean, they have HVAC now. When, when they were built, they didn't. Um, there's no longer an opportunity to keep those um, schools afloat. So um, we had a bond committee of citizens from Saxe, Rowlett, and, of course, Garland. Uh, we're a tri-city network. And, and they selected the improvements. They selected this entire project. That's what people are excited about. This did not come from administration or the board. This came from our citizens. And so what they said is, hey, let's go ahead and get these aging buildings and let's consolidate them. So we're looking at cons um, eight buildings to consolidate into four and create updated learning environments that are fiscally responsible, energy efficient, and great places to learn for teaching and our students as well. The, the citizens selected this, but how much are Garland homeowners going to be on, on the hook for this? Obviously, bonds are, are, are floated yes. out and sold to yes. investors, but, but what will Garland homeowners and property owners pay? So, you know, the, the investment is going to be 6.6 .6 cents for this bond, um, which will still be 22 cents lower than five years ago. 
So it, it it's not a big cents. Interest. That's like per 100 uh, of taxable value or yes, what? Yes, per 100 taxable value. Okay. So 6.6 .6 cents and 22 cents lower than five years ago. Um, the citizens of the bond committee felt that's a very manageable rate to incur for the, the amount of investment they're going to get in return. How confident are you this will pass? Um, I, I don't know what will come from it. But what I will say is that when communities invest in their school district, their communities thrive. And when communities thrive, cities just, just go through the roof. We see that across the, the DFW area. And so people understand um, investment will lead to greater community and, and, and city endeavors. Dr. Lopez, thank you very much. I appreciate you, thank you. Coming up, there's now a second Democrat considering a challenge against Ted Cruz next year, but does he have a path to victory? The Roundtable is next. This is Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley. Time now for Reporters Roundtable to put the headlines in perspective. I am Mitra is back with us from the Texas Tribune in Austin. Bud Kennedy is here from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram and Bernadine Steptoe, political producer at WFAA in Dallas. I and let's start with you. The worst kept secret in Texas politics, State Senator Roland Gutierrez, who represents San Antonio and Uvalde, considering a run against Ted Cruz next year for that U.S. Senate seat. It, it, we've also heard Colin Allred, Dallas Congressman, Dallas Democrat, might be running for it as well. Do either of these guys have a shot at uh, a path to victory here? Well, it kind of you know, depends on the politics of the time uh, you know, of the election, too. Obviously, when, when Senator Cruz up for a re-election, he wasn't uh, you know, the most popular official in the state. And so there's, you know, for Beto O'Rourke, it seemed like there was an opening on, and it was a tighter than usual Senate race. You know, for, for Senator Gutierrez, it's about kind of, you know, there's a, he's a very clear issue of what he's been outspoken on, the whole aspect of, you know, the, 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 the Uvalde school shooting and the aspects about guns. And I think that's a, an area where he could really counter Cruz. You know, for U.S. Representative Allred, too, there's things like that, too. But I think, you know, Senator Gutierrez has really kind of drawn that that clear line on, on the issue for where he would campaign the most on. And Bud, indeed he has. He's really raised his profile over the last year after that Uvalde shooting. Yeah, Senator Gutierrez is the hero of the Uvalde parents, and that's the dominant issue in Houston and San Antonio, and Colin Allred doesn't have a, a profile down there on that issue. Uh, he would probably do better in those markets. Either way, Ted Cruz is almost certainly going to win re-election if he chooses to run again when he chooses. The, uh, this, this is not a gubernatorial year. This is a presidential year. This is more like Cruz's first election in 2012 where he steamrolled Paul Sadler. That's a trivia answer for you. And that's a name we haven't heard in quite some time. Bernadine, your eyebrows went up when he said that Cruz will, will win re-election almost certainly. Do, do you think Cruz is vulnerable next year? Well, I wouldn't say that he's vulnerable. The problem is I wouldn't say that he would win this early in the election process. But uh, keep in mind now, you're, it's, it is a presidential election, and you're going to get out a lot more voters than you normally would in, in an election that's not presidential, particularly for Democrats, because a lot of times that's when they do come out. And then another thing that they're, they're going to have to make sure, the Democrats are going to have to make sure, sure that they have an issue that's going to resonate statewide. Yeah. Uh, because to be a one issue, Uvalde, that's not going to carry the whole state. Let's go back to the beginning of our, our program here, Ian, and talk about Dan Patrick, Lieutenant Governor. He really took a much tougher tone over the last week, especially in the interview with us, calling the Speaker of the House California Dade, taking a, a page out of Trump's playbook, also saying hell would freeze over before that House tax plan, uh, property tax reduction plan would pass. What, what does that suggest about the balance of power in Austin right now? Well, you also have to look at where we are in the terms of the legislative session, too. You know, Lieutenant Governor has, you know, cleared basically all of the priority bills that he had set and is waiting on the House to kind of move forward. The House is still working through a lot of their bills, too. And I think, you know, certainly the Lieutenant Governor is trying to kind of, you know, put a little bit of pressure on the House to kind of move because I think he really wants to get moving on his priority legislation. So a lot of this, I think, is also just also just about the calendar of the legislative session. Bud, what do you make of it? Well, you know, Jason, all this is for television, holding up wads of money and, you know, saying that he's going to force a special session. I mean, this is Dan Patrick trying to act tough when he's not winning uh, his causes, the, the, his arguments that, you know, the, the tax debate is about, I mean, his, his version would help senior citizen voters. The House's version would help businesses more. The House is going to dig in. You know, the, the argument he makes, you know, might look good on television, but it's not going to win 76 votes in the House. Bernadine? 
Well, and then I smiled because the mere fact that he's attacking not only the uh, Speaker of the House, but the House itself and praising the Senate shows that he's losing ground and that he, he doesn't have enough influence in the House to get what he wants done. So he's going out and he's appealing through the media and through the uh, voters and the constituents, but it's obvious that he's not winning at this point. But we've seen the lieutenant governor force a special session in the past back in 2017. There's five weeks left in the session. How likely is that this uh, this time? Oh, he, he said he would do it again, but it really didn't work for him last time. So the uh, you know, he can he can say what he wants and but he, he does you know start by saying the governor calls special sessions. Uh, he would just seem petty if he tried to force one. And, and, and I and what do you make of that there at the Capitol? Do you, do, you, do you think you know one of these issues that hasn't been settled if it's not settled in five weeks might end up in a special session either forced by the lieutenant governor or called by the governor? It, it kind of it also really depends too on kind of what gets passed out. Obviously, you know, the lieutenant governor is very adamant about his kind of uh, property tax relief plan and and the way they've kind of uh, approached the budget too, as well as aspects of, you know, kind of natural gas plants and the and supporting um, more investment that way. So there potentially are some angles too, but it ultimately is like, I think, you know, like, like you know, like Bud and Bernardino said, have said, you know, it's, it's about the governor too, and kind of where he's yeah. feeling the need to, to, to call. Jason, he's right about some things, but he may not win those arguments. Gentlemen, we appreciate it. Bernardine, thank you so much. And thank you for watching as well. We're back next Sunday to take you inside Texas politics. Hope you can join us then. Take care. Thank you.